Storm clouds made Denver look pretty ominous this afternoon. Winter-like weather decided to make a swift return to Colorado after a nearly snowless April. Now the flakes have just started to come down tonight as the snow moves into the Denver area. Lauren, the bulk of the snow, though, is still on its way. More coming. That's right. Snowfall has just started here in Denver and almost right on time at nine o'clock. I'm in the nine news backyard where you can see I need my trusty umbrella here. We do have these snowflakes and they're going to last through the rest of the night and into tomorrow, even intensifying in some areas as we watch for heavier bands to move through. Right now, let's go ahead and take a look at our current conditions. 36 degrees at DIA. The snow hasn't reached the airport yet. You can see it's still dry there, but it feels closer to 27 degrees with winds coming in from the north northeast at around 15 miles per hour. Our HD Doppler radar showing a big system moving its way in from the northwest. We've been monitoring snow showers in the high country and western slope all day. They finally start to make their way into Denver and northern portions of the front range. We're going to continue to watch for any rain showers to transition into snow and then a couple of inches of snow by tomorrow afternoon, even here in Denver. We're going to see those higher totals off to the west, smaller totals as you make your way toward the east. Overnight lows near 27 degrees, so a chilly snow snowy night ahead. I'll let you know when we can see or how much more snow we could see and when it's expected to stop just ahead of my full seven day forecast. All right, Lauren, thanks. In your headlines, authorities have new information on a little girl missing for a week now. Six year old Jazelle Martinez was last seen off Wolf Street near Sheridan and Sixth Avenue last Friday. She was wearing a white T-shirt with a rainbow on it and blue jeans. Martinez also has a purple birthmark on her lower left side of her back. She was seen with her sister, 20 year old Alexis Martinez, who does not have custody. So if you see Jazelle or Alexis, please call police. Investigators are still looking for whoever threw a rock into a woman's windshield Wednesday night, killing her 20 year old Alexa Bartel. She was on her way home from work when somebody threw a rock at her car. There are multiple financial rewards now being offered for information in this case. A handful of other drivers were also hurt that night, sometime within a 45 minute span. Police tweeted this picture of all the different places they say rocks were thrown. And that last one at 1045 was the one that hit and killed Alexa. The Jefferson County Sheriff's Office is asking for Tesla owners to help them out because see Tesla's constantly record activity while driving. So investigators hope somebody has a recording that might give them a lead. Crime Stoppers is giving out a $2,000 reward for information leading to a suspect. There's also a $15,000 reward from Commercial Flooring Services where Alexa and her mom worked. Today, a jury found a former Aurora police officer guilty of failing to intervene while another officer was assaulting a suspect. It's the first time a Colorado jury has convicted an officer of this charge since it went on the books back in 2020. Forgensine Martinez faces up to a year in jail when she's sentenced in June. The body camera footage of the incident is a bit hard to watch. Martinez and his part and her partner, former officer John Hobart, responded to a trespassing call in July of 2021 with Within minutes, Hobart is seen pistol whipping and choking Kyle Vincent, even pointing a gun at his head. Prosecutors say Martinez stood by, just watching as Hobart struck Vincent as many as 13 times with his gun. Martinez testified in her own defense yesterday, saying it happened so fast she didn't have time to intervene, and she said she feared for her own safety. The other officer resigned from his position with APD and is scheduled to go to trial in November. Tonight, people gathered to remember a man from Colorado who was killed in Sudan. The Sudanese American community of Colorado, they all gathered at the state capitol tonight in honor of Abu Bakr. His family says he was killed in the ongoing conflict in Sudan. We spoke to his son Khalid tonight, who says he hopes to raise awareness about the violence that's happening there. My dad didn't die in vain, you know, like my dad, you know, like look at everyone here to support him. Everyone, you know, came out to support him. My dad was a great man. And you know he died in, like he died for no reason. He died just trying to see his family. I just want, and there's everyone here has family in Sudan. Everyone next to me right here has family in Sudan. I don't want anyone here to experience what I'm going through right now. Khalid says his mother and sisters are still in Sudan, and he's working with the embassy to try to get them back to Colorado. Denver has some, let's say, room for improvement when it comes to handling homeless encampments. The city auditor and groups that help people experiencing homelessness agree the city needs to be clearer about certain policies. Luis De Leon takes a closer look at this report. First, it's important to understand some numbers. The audit cites the Metro Denver Homeless Initiative's point in time count when the amount of people experiencing homelessness on a single night is counted. More than 4,000 people experienced homelessness on January 24th of last year in Denver County. 
Of those, more than 1,000 were unsheltered. Excluding 2021 due to the pandemic, the number of unsheltered people has been increasing. With more people falling into the cycle of homelessness, um, you know, that means that it's harder for us sometimes to connect people with housing resources because there's just more people in need and there's not a lot more resources available. Kathy Alderman is Chief Communications and Public Policy Officer for the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, who says they play no role in encampment sweeps or enforcing the camping ban, but they are not surprised by the findings of the audit. The audit did find the city's response to homeless encampments is mostly compliant. But among other things, the audit says the city needs to do more to ensure people on the streets have equitable access to stored personal belongings and that the city also needs to document policies and procedures. I think it can be really difficult when you don't have a single department doing um, these kinds of actions and it's spread across multiple departments. The audit also found that the city needs to identify a consistent way to track encampment related spending. At least 10 agencies are involved in encampment response, spending more than $13 million on enforcement between January of 2019 and June of last year. That number does not include expenses from Denver police. I think what we really need to focus on is investing in solutions that work. And we know that those solutions are long-term affordable housing with supportive services. There were 36 total recommendations in that audit, and it also showed that the city agreed to all of them. City leaders also claimed in a statement that they've already implemented a few of those changes. But, Alex, we know that we have a runoff coming up in the mayor's race, and that has been a big topic for voters, and it could really shape the direction that the city goes for how to tackle all this. Yeah, good point, because voters certainly have made it known. They expect the new mayor to come in and have new ideas to tackle the homelessness right. issue and make those known before yep. June 6th. Yep, absolutely. All right, Louise, thanks. Coloradans with low incomes could soon qualify for so many more rental properties under a bill that is making its way through the state legislature. A lot of landlords will require tenants to earn at least three times the cost of rent, but this bill, which is sponsored by Democrats, would cap the minimum income requirements at twice the cost of rent. It would also cap security deposits to the cost of two months rent. This is about trying to get folks who have the hardest time finding housing and who need it the most a little bit of a more um, level playing field. We're helping people live, work, and play in the same place. That's key. We all want that. Critics say the bill's new requirements could lead to more defaults and evictions. This bill mandates that uh, housing providers accept applications that are 50% of income and that's just too high. That'll allow somebody to overextend themselves to spend more money on rent than safe for them. Bill already passed the Senate. It is now headed to the House. The U.S. Supreme Court is protecting access to the abortion pill for now. Today, justices blocked a lower court ruling from Texas that would roll back the FDA's approval of Mifepristone. This decision comes after emergency requests from the Biden administration and the drug maker of Mr. Mifepristone. The drug has been approved for use in the U.S. since 2000. Mifepristone is used in combination with a second drug in more than half of all abortions in the U.S. Today's action will most likely leave access to the pill unchanged as as appeals play out. A first in the nation law signed by Democratic Governor Jared Polis will not be enforced yet, which means the so-called abortion reversal treatment can continue for now in Colorado. Hours after the law, which bans that practice, went into effect, a faith-based clinic won a temporary restraining order from a federal judge. Major medical institutions do not support abortion reversal treatment. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists calls it unproven and unethical. This week, though, the state's medical and nursing boards voted not to enforce this new law's ban until they can go through a rulemaking process on these treatments. Democratic Attorney General Phil Weiser says that won't be finished until September. It's an end to a drag racing era in Colorado. Bandemir Speedway is leaving Morrison at the end of the summer, but they're hoping to make a comeback. The Bandemir family agreed to sell the land and property, but are actively looking for another location in Denver. The National Hot Rod Association says the goal is just a short drag racing hiatus. The Bandemirs say they're hopeful that they'll find another unique location where they can continue their legacy started six decades ago. The NHRA Mile High Nationals will be the Speedway's last event. That's July 14th through the 16th.